Professor Dave and Chegg here, figures such as Max Planck, Albert Einstein, and Niels Bohr set the stage for the biggest revolution in the history of physics, the quantum revolution. Once their work was understood by their peers in the science community, it was clear that classical physics, which was perfect for describing macroscopic objects, simply did not adequately describe the subatomic world. When looking at the world of the very small, we must accept that there is wave-particle duality and electromagnetic radiation, previously thought of as waves, clearly exhibits particle-like behavior. Now let's see what happened next. Through Einstein and the photoelectric effect, we first came to understand that light exhibits wave-particle duality. But this idea was extended further by Louis de Broglie, who proposed that it's not just waves that can behave like particles, but it is also the case that particles can behave like waves. This means that all matter must have a wavelength, which is called the de Broglie wavelength, and it is given by the following equation involving Planck's constant, as well as mass and velocity. Notice that the wavelength is inversely proportional to mass, so for macroscopic objects with a lot of mass, the wavelength is so unbelievably tiny that it is negligible. This means that when we discuss baseballs and humans, we don't have to worry about wavelengths. Classical physics will work just fine. But for tiny particles like electrons, the wavelength is significant, so beyond just photons, we now have to view electrons as being both particles and waves. As strange as this sounds, electrons were about to become much stranger still. A physicist named Werner Heisenberg realized that there are limits to how accurately we can simultaneously measure both the position and the momentum of a particle like an electron. The more we try to know about its location, the less we can know about its momentum, and the more we know about its momentum, the less we can know about where it's located. This has nothing to do with the sophistication of our instruments. It is a fundamental quality of matter. If we could know both the position and momentum of an electron, we could describe it merely as a particle. But we've learned that an electron is not just a particle, it's also a wave. So it will defy any attempt to have its behavior reduced to strictly particle-like determinacy. This concept is summarized in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Delta X is the uncertainty in position, and delta P is the uncertainty in momentum. And we see that their product must be greater than h bar over two, where h bar is equal to h over two pi. What this really means is that a reduction in the uncertainty in one parameter must result in an increase in the uncertainty of the other, such that if we know one variable with certainty, the other will be completely unknowable. Again, this theoretically applies to any matter, but it is only significant in tiny particles like electrons, which is why when we measure the speed of a fastball, it doesn't suddenly disappear, and when we locate a stationary object, it doesn't suddenly fly away. This kind of uncertainty applies to the quantum world only. We should also realize that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle applies to any set of complementary variables, not just location and momentum. This also works for energy and time, with interesting results, like the idea that virtual particles can pop into existence literally without cause if they then vanish again, returning the borrowed energy that was allowed for a tiny amount of time, due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This idea imposes limits on what is knowable in science, and is ultimately a consequence of wave particle duality, something we will have to get used to as we examine the quantum world. Once it was understood that particles like electrons were also waves, effort was put forth to find a mathematical model that could describe the wave-like behavior of electrons. Erwin Schrödinger extended the work of de Broglie by incorporating his de Broglie relation into his own wave equation called the Schrödinger equation. And when he applied his equation to the hydrogen atom, it was able to reproduce a lot of the known values without having to invoke any extraneous assumptions. Quantization was a natural consequence of the wave equation. Of course, we won't get into any of the math here. It's just way too complicated and not relevant to the introductory chemistry principles we are investigating. But generally speaking, Schrodinger visualized electrons as three-dimensional wave functions, represented by the Greek letter psi. This was elucidated further by Max Born, who proposed an interpretation of the wave function that states that they are not physical waves, but rather complex probability amplitudes, and the square of the magnitude of the wave function describes the probability of an electron existing in a particular space. So we can now think of electrons as being waves of probability density distributed around particular regions in space. 
Here is the Schrodinger equation, with this being called the Hamiltonian operator, a set of mathematical operations representing the total energy of the particle. Psi, once again, is the wave function that is used to describe the probability distribution of the particle, and E is the actual value of the total energy of the particle. The work of Schrodinger and others that followed served to outline the foundation for quantum mechanics, which, just in the way that classical mechanics accurately describes the motion of classical macroscopic objects, quantum mechanics is now the mathematical model that is able to describe the motion of quantum objects. It's very confusing stuff, and we don't need to understand the specific details of what we just went over, but chemistry is the business of electrons, and electrons are quantum mechanical particles. So if we want to understand chemistry, we need to gain a basic conceptual understanding of quantum mechanics. The end result of all this work was to give us a revised picture of electrons in an atom, not as spherical particles orbiting the nucleus in a classical manner, but rather as waves of probability density that inhabit things called orbitals. We will in fact need to know quite a bit about these orbitals, so let's move forward and investigate those next. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.